I'd actually like to start the panel discussion by just asking the panelists uh, to one by one introduce themselves. And since uh, you're each here sort of as a representative of a particular uh, a particular software package, maybe say a little bit about how you came to uh, to begin working on that package, what your history's been right. with that. I just speak. Oh yeah, it works. Cool. Um, well, my name is Christian, and I am working uh, a lot on the uh, Mulu package, which is part of uh, the sort of like wider Trilinos uh, software environment. Um, apart from doing software development for uh, for Trilinos, I'm also working a lot on uh, non-local problems. Um, I came to Sandia, well, as a postdoc. And then I initially didn't want to stay, and at some point I just ended up staying. So, yeah. <laughs> Pass of uh, least resistance in some ways. So I'm Todd Munson. I have been at Argonne National Laboratory for about 22 years now. I started as a postdoc in September of 2000, and I've been there ever since, progressing through the career levels. My background is in numerical optimization, and so I came to Argonne to work with the numerical optimizers, and then I stayed and I spent a lot of time working on the toolkit for advanced optimization. These days I am on the extended leadership team for the Exascale Computing Project, so I manage the software ecosystem and delivery area there, which includes E4S, SPAC, the containers effort, as well as our workflows effort there. I'm also the director of the Petsy Tau ECP project and the deputy director for the FastMap Institute. So if you have questions about any of those things, I'm happy to answer them. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Osborne and I am from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And today I'm here representing the Hyper Package. And let's see, I started at the lab about seven years ago as a postdoc. I was working on multi-level solvers for uncertainty quantification. Part of my work as a postdoc was using a software stack that involved Hyper, and then eventually I started actually working on the Hyper team. Um, I'm kind of focusing more on um, improving their build system and things like that. I'm also a part of the XSDK, which Arika has mentioned earlier today. Hi, I'm Dan Reynolds. Uh, I'm a professor at Southern Methodist University. I'm the token academic on the panel. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm here representing Sundials, which is a time integration library. Uh, a while back, I was a postdoc at Lawrence Livermore National Lab right after coming out of, out of my PhD, where I was uh, uh, tasked with, with essentially applying Sundials into various uh, application codes and kind of working with, with scientists to get, get the, uh, tools in their stuff. And uh, I continued those collaborations for a while, uh, kind of as I went on into academia. And then, and then uh, eventually I started uh, building new tools that Sundials didn't have, and then getting them back into the library and, uh, and kind of strengthen the ties that I'd built uh, years before. Uh, I'm Peter Geissels. Uh, I work at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in the Scalable Solvers Group. I've been at uh, Berkeley Lab since 2013. Uh, I started there as a, as a postdoc after coming from uh, University of Antwerp in Belgium. I'm the main developer of the uh, Strumpak library, which is a library of solvers for dense and sparse linear systems uh, using uh, rank structures, so low rank approximations, and uh, in hierarchical matrices. Uh, and so we use that to develop uh, preconditioners for uh, sparse linear systems. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, so I'm I'm not goofing off and looking at my text messages. I'm actually looking at uh, at <laughs> at the questions that people submitted uh, on the form. Um, I'm going to start with uh, I'm going to I'm going to start with less with questions that are less likely to generate controversy and then move move on. So so I'll start with one that I think is is not very controversial, but it's from. Uh, uh, a participant who's been thinking really about, uh, you know, scalability and, you know, like uh, sort of how large are the problems that you can solve with the packages that we've discussed today and, and can you, you know, scale them to, uh, you know, a large university cluster or can you scale them to all a frontier? The, the actual wording of the question is simply, uh, what are the scaling limitations of the various solvers discussed today? And are they scalable to a large university cluster or to all of Frontier? And uh, the person who asked the question, if you want to add anything to that, feel free to raise your hand and do so. Okay, I, otherwise, uh, okay, so um, 
let's just uh, go go down the line, I guess, and and say, you know, like, what can you say about about the scaling of your your code, or or just thoughts on scalability in general, how important that or or not that is, etc. I guess I'll start. Yeah. Um, so, in our group, we work on sparse direct solvers, and they are uh, known to be quite hard to scale to, to large numbers of nodes and, and cores, but we've been spending a lot of effort to improve that. Uh, for instance, Sherry also introduced the so-called communication avoiding uh, factorization in, in SuperLU, which improves the uh, strong scalability uh, drastically. Um, you can also uh, combine solvers in, in multiple ways, for instance, uh, use like a block check Kobe method and then use a sparse direct solver in, inside blocks to improve scalability. And sometimes maybe trade off uh, conversions for scalability uh, tricks you can do like that. Uh, so from the time integration perspective, we usually aren't the limiting factor for scalability. Uh, f f as far as, as we're concerned, if you can solve the, the underlying linear systems really scalably, then we, we kind of inherit that and, and get larger from there. Um, you know, we've run our, 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 our codes with, with certain uh, problems, up to hundreds of thousands of, of, of uh, uh, MPI ranks. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, the, the real question is, is, is the problem one that really requires a lot of synchronization between what's going on, or, or is there a lot of asynchrony that's, that, that's, that, the, that can be leveraged? And of course, the more synchronization you have, the harder it is for GPUs and things like that to, to get really large. But you know, university clusters are, 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 are pretty trivial. Let's see, I would say yes, if you can generate a linear system and fit it on your system, then Hyper could be able to solve it. Um, we have been doing some work in multi-precision efforts. And yeah, if I guess, yeah, if, you're, if your application software um, doesn't take up too much of your computing time, then yes, Hyper would be able to solve your, your linear system. So in terms of the Petsy Tau project, I would say that yes, it will scale to whatever size cluster or machine you have. The real question is whether it will scale well to those uh, systems. Uh, and it really depends upon your problem and the methods that you're applying. Some of the methods will scale extremely well on those systems. They may not perform you know, ideally, but they'll scale well. Uh, other methods won't scale as well, but you know we'll give you solutions faster. So it really depends upon your problem, and it depends upon uh, the system, the the methods that you're using, including the preconditioners. So it's a hard question to answer, I would say, and we can't really get into saying yes, it'll scale on everything, because it really depends upon your problem and the methods that you're trying to use to tackle it. Uh, from the optimization side, it's very similar to the time-stepping sides from Dan. It's not the limiting factor for scalability. The ability to solve the linear systems is the limiting factor. And there, it, it really is dependent upon your problem. All right, uh, speaking for, for Mulu, which is obviously very similar to, uh, to the problems that Hyper is facing, theoretically, yes, we're perfectly scalable. But uh, obviously, any little uh, sort of like uh, issue in load balancing or any sort of other little issue, they become worse and worse at scale. And so it's sort of a, well, we will scale, yes, but uh, there's a matter of uh, fixing all these little bugs that will always creep in and that we haven't seen so far because we haven't scaled that far yet. But uh, we're obviously always uh, sort of pushing this further and further and uh, solving larger and larger problems. And I, I think for, uh, I mean, I, I don't know what you're all, all doing in uh, sort of like uh, your daily life as an academic or at a lab, but not everybody runs, uh, I don't know, 100 billion problems just like that every other day. And for most intents and purposes, I would say, yes, we do scale and there is there are no issues for, uh, for reasonable problems. And if you are really running massively large problems, using our software, then we're obviously also more than happy to actually uh, interact with you and help you. All right, thank you. I have a, a, another question that was uh, submitted by one of the participants that uh, is uh, sort of related to the, the last one, and I'll just uh, read it verbatim. It's, uh, 
Most powerful supercomputers generally rely on including many very powerful GPUs. As a result, it is very difficult, if not impossible, for, a sparse linear, for sparse linear solvers to effectively hide communications behind calculations, and a lot of the node's compute power is wasted. What are your thoughts about this trend? Do you think that this can be somehow mitigated, or is this going to get worse? Uh, I'll just uh, add uh, that uh, although the... Um, uh, the, the writer of this question asked about sparse linear solvers. I think this really applies to, to lots of things beyond sparse linear solvers, anything where you don't have some very nice, regular, cache-amenable uh, kind of calculation to do. Um, and, uh, I, and I don't think it's, it's necessarily just a problem with effectively hiding communications. It's just that you have uh, a lot of latencies that you have to deal with on these very throughput-oriented devices that GPUs are, uh, there are still people who, who have applications that are very, uh, where, where latency is very important, uh, and uh, so what, what can be done about this trend from your view as a, as a library uh, package designer or, uh, or, or otherwise? And uh, this one, I, I don't think we have to go down the line. People can just volunteer. <laughs> I, I think uh, if you have a, like a sparse iterative kind of method, uh, which is typically memory bandwidth limited, you're not using your uh, floating point units very eff effectively, but I think that's fine. So there's this thing called the roofline model. So you want to uh, optimize your code so that for the arithmetic intensity of your algorithm, uh, you're as close as possible to the, to the roofline. So you're either bandwidth uh, limited or compute bound. Uh, and if you're bandwidth limited, then maybe you're not using the full uh, floating point capacity, but then you're also probably using less energy while this floating point unit is, is, is idle. I think it's more about the, uh, the, the energy usage. You don't have to focus too much on, on floating point per second performance. But uh, in the end, it's the uh, time to solution that counts. So I was going to say that it, I think it will get at least slightly better. So the GPU companies have recognized sparse linear solvers as sort of a need to do on their machines. So there's things like KuSparse and there's AMGX. I don't think it'll get better immediately and it will probably never be perfect, but there are, uh, the companies are investing in sort of the sparse linear systems and sparse linear solvers. Uh, maybe we should also mention that, I mean, we can also from a discretization point of view simply change and not try to solve the same systems just on different machines. And I, I mean, one way to do this is trying to go to higher order systems that give you a bit more accuracy for the degrees of freedom that you're solving and give you a bit more data to work with. But uh, I, I'm sure that there are similar approaches for for other types of discretizations where, yeah, just one to sort of gear your discretization a bit more to uh, to the system that you're working with. Following up with what Christian just said, one thing that we've been working uh, pretty diligently recently in Sundials to do is to allow the integrators to be very flexible. So you can choose some things to run at, at small time steps, others at big time steps, some implicit, some explicit. And while a lot of those decisions need to be made on, on your end as an application developer, uh, it, it does allow you to leverage things that, you know, one of the challenges with GPUs is synchronizations. And every time we have to do a dot product over everything, we just get, get hit with that. But by having the flexibility to make some things operate at different time scales or, or some implicit, some explicit, it allows you a little bit more flexibility to, to hide some of, the, to, to reduce the number of those synchronizations in your code. But it, it's definitely problem dependent. You know Everyone that. else has an answer. I want an answer too. <laughs> Let's see. I mean, it's, you know, clearly based on the answers, this is a big problem. Um, I would just say, for Hyper's perspective, um, we do offer um, different interfaces. So we have the structured versus unstructured. And, you know, we're seeing much better. Um, this issue is mitigated with our structured interface just because we have, you know, underlying 
data structures that are more amenable for um, these GPUs. But yeah, a big problem, somewhat open question. Uh, I'm just going to add because we uh, we don't have a representative from uh, the Seed Project, which is uh, the Center for uh, what Efficient Exascale Discretizations. I'm not sure if I have the acronym right. Uh, that's part of the Exascale Computing Project. Uh, there's been a lot of work uh, by folks in Seed. And I know there are at least a few uh, attendees in the audience who work who work on the Seed Project. Um, there's a lot of interest that be, because of the issues that that have just been raised on, um, like there's a lot of renewed interest in, you know, like uh, matrix-free methods uh, and the very high order finite element discretizations that can, uh, you know, map better onto, onto GPUs. Now these, these often involve, um, a so-called matrix-free method often involves, you know, like actually constructing some matrices, but you're really trying to, you know, minimize just, you know, having like a, a huge, uh, you know, global linear system where you have to, you know, pull a coefficient matrix through main memory all the time. Yeah. Let me see what's uh, next on the list of questions here. Oh, okay, okay. If it's time for the controversial ones, uh, let's see here. Yeah, okay, oh, well, that, okay, let's see here, okay. Um, uh, okay. So, um, for uh, each speaker, uh, for, for their numerical package, uh, th this, this participant would like to know, one, what is the best thing about it compared to other packages? <laughs> and then two, what thing could be most improved about your package compared to others? I guess I'll start with Peter. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you want me to go first? Yeah. <laughs> I can go first. Okay, so the best part of Petsy Tau is Barry Smith. So Barry Smith is sort of the, uh, the person who created Petsy. He answers a lot of email. He does a lot of development on Petsy. So he is definitely the coolest part of Petsy, in my opinion. The thing that can be most improved in Petsy is probably Barry Smith as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think the best thing uh, is maybe um, <laughs> the, uh, the performance is quite good, I would say, compared to other similar uh, packages. Uh, but the, uh, the documentation should definitely be improved. Uh, and the examples, um, a lot of features are missing. Yeah, this This is a tough question. Um, I'd say maybe that one of the best things about, about Sundials is just that we, we try to really uh, be extra flexible. And so uh, there are many time integration libraries where everybody marches with the exact same time step. Synchronization is a, ch a challenge. Uh, and so you know, we, we, we've been trying to make it so that you, we can map the algorithms to the problems better than making you take your problems and stuff in one algorithm. Uh, now that said, other, other packages try to do the same kind of thing. What's the worst thing? I, I don't know. We, we don't have a very uh, large team, and so a lot of the things that we want to do, we don't have time to, to get around to doing, and so it would be really nice if we, uh, if we you know, maybe had a bigger, bigger group internally or even a larger external development uh, uh, ecosystem where people are contributing. For Hyper, one of the really good things is it has a very low barrier to entry. At a minimum, you essentially just need a C compiler. Um, you can add in any additional programming models you want to use. Um, but just to get up and running, it's really relatively very easy. Um, something that is I am working on, I will say that to improve, is adding in more features for our CMake build option. Right now, we're relying primarily on autoconf, so we're trying to bring that up to speed. All right, I had a little bit of time to think about this. <laughs> um, so I mean, our, probably our best uh, quality is that we are extremely flexible. 
we essentially have adopted a, uh, a factory style uh, sort of uh, approach to setting up our solver, which means that we can effectively recombine a lot of different components in a very flexible way. At the same time, that's also, in the long run, probably a, uh, a fairly fault-prone approach. Um, it is very easy to, to try something new with Mulu and absolutely break the code and get a, not, not even be sure what the code is actually doing anymore. And that doesn't only apply to our users, unfortunately, but also to the developers. But uh, I mean, that, that's the, the, the cost of, uh, of a lot of flexibility that, uh, yes, I mean, with great power. Okay, I have a, 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 per, a perhaps slightly less controversial question that's actually related to, to what we just talked about. And uh, actually, uh, Anne uh, hinted at this in her, her wrap-up uh, when she, she mentioned package fatigue. Um, there are a whole lot of packages that, uh, that are, are kind of within the, the, the sort of supercomputer scientific computing ecosystem that, that we've been talking about. And uh, so a few people are wondering things basically like with, with so many of these libraries, a lot of which have similar or overlapping functionality, like uh, how do you decide, uh, you know, between different packages to use or maybe how do you decide uh, that you, you should use a particular package and, and not just for some sort of functionality just kind of, kind of do it yourself? Have any takers? I mean, just from personal experience, I, I, I mean, it, it's not a, it's not going to be a great response. But uh, just trying out these different packages, trying each and every one of them a little bit, and then based on that, just trying to narrow it down as quickly as possible. And I, I mean, it's it's hard to judge the quality of a package just by by looking at the cover. I mean. Obviously, if a lot of people are using a, a certain package, then yes, it's probably fairly general. It can do a lot of obviously interesting things that lots of people are using. But in the end, I mean, if for your special use case, yes, you have to, to try it out and see if it works and try to uh, get it done in a reasonable amount of time. I think that... XSDK's effort to increase interoperabilities between packages is going to help in this. So you won't necessarily have to marry a package um, to be able to get functionality just from that one package. You will be able to have increased interoperabilities that, you know, from Petsy, you were able to call Hyper, you could call, um, you know, Trilinos, things like that, I think are going to be um, increasingly important. Trying to think of a, of a reasonable answer. I think that you definitely have to go and uh, look at the packages, look at the communities surrounding the packages, ask some questions uh, from the community, see if you get like an answer to their email list, for example. So are they responsive to your needs? Uh, are they interested in engaging with you? Uh, and, and try that for a number of packages that you think might satisfy your needs and then take a look at the packages themselves. Look at the examples, do the examples, uh, look close to the problems that you wanna solve and then just start narrowing it down from there. I think uh, the XSD inter interoperability will be beneficial uh, in terms of sort of selecting some of these packages and the interoperability among the packages, but definitely look at the package communities uh, look at the, the problems that they're solving, look at their examples, look at their scalability, and all of this stuff should be available for, for any of the packages that you're looking at. Anyone else, or is that everybody? I want to say that I agree with what Sarah and, and Todd say. Uh, we spend a lot of time actually developing interfaces from uh, Petsy and Trilinos to, to our code. So maybe uh, your code, if it's using Petsy, is already capable of just calling our code just by changing some command line uh, options. Uh, and then, yeah, indeed, you can always just send a, a quick email, uh, like, is it a good idea for me to try your solver or is that just stupid? Uh, and it's short answer for us, uh, yeah. Okay, um, 
Let's see, I, I, I didn't quite get a chance to, to see the, the questions that Ann had. Should I, should I just go back? Okay. Okay, let's see. Um, so, oh, these are good questions. Um, let's see here. Um, well, all, all of you guys can, all of the panelists can see the questions right here. <laughs> Which means we can also see the answers too. <laughs> Well, th those are Anne's, Anne's answers. Mm -hmm. now, I, I would like Todd to, to, to look at this and tell me how Anne is wrong. <laughs> so, I, so I like this first question. What role will reusable libraries and tools play on future systems and how has the role changed from the past? I think uh, one of the, in, the legacies or one of the benefits of the Exascale Computing Project uh, has been that there has been a greater uptick in terms of package adoption by the application domains and as well as the interoperability across the applications. And that has to do with the incentives associated with the Exascale Computing Project and the way that the, that project is set up in order to deliver you know, the Exascale software stack that's needed. And I, I hope that that becomes an enduring legacy of ECP. There's the danger that when ECP goes away that all of that stuff will fall apart. I hope it does not, and I think XSDK has shown that, that it's possible for it to just stay together and for the community to go, grow and thrive together uh, because we really are better together than we are sort of standing off on our own. Uh, and sort of that has been the impetus for the increased role in in my opinion, in that libraries have been playing in the application domains. And I thought I would never say it, but like Salman Habib has been starting to use some libraries now. So it's like uh, an incredible shift from, I'm an application developer, I'm gonna do everything on my own to now I am actually looking at using libraries these days to do some of the, the things that we would have just rolled on our own from the past. So I think it's been, it's been a, a pretty good time with regards to ECP from that perspective. And I just hope that it continues and becomes one of the enduring legacies of ECP. I, I mean, I am seeing this point out as no more meaningful simulations from scratch and that doesn't really uh, resonate with me. I mean, we're still gonna be playing with the same, I don't know, Lego bricks. It's just that we have cooler bricks now. Um, I, I think that we, I, I mean, there were always certain components that none of us were actually, or I, I, that I never in my lifetime actually would touch and like try to, to work on. I mean, I didn't write MPI and I didn't write actually ever a direct solver. Still, I, I can use them and I'm very happy that I can use them. And well, I mean, if, if I start using bigger bricks in the future that are already provided on a system, then I'll happily do so. I don't think that that has anything to do with, I mean, there's still going to be research and, and work on, on combining these components. It's just at a different level. I want to give a slight uh, difference of opinion from what Todd said, and that, that is, and it's not really different. It, there, there, there's a group of us packages who have been part of the ECP, and then most software packages have not been part of the ECP. And those of us who have been part of the ECP, we've had all this 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 support and and you know dictums from from on high to to really push in the way of of, of uh, maintainability and, and adoptability and all the good good things that, that that Todd just said. But but you know most new algorithms aren't invented by our teams. They're they're invented by you know academic entities or the, or, or smaller scale things. And I don't know if 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 ECP has set in in place a a, a, a culture so that the things that we've had to adopt are now going to be adopted by all these other people and all these other packages. And so I, I wonder how much we can do to really help uh, set this tone so that uh, everybody can start doing these more maintainable uh, type things. And I know that the XSDK isn't just uh, ECP, it's, it's, it's broader and there's a lot more packages in it than those of us who, who have been funded by ECP, but I, I, you know, I just, it's hard to see how, how, how it's purely defined as increasing. It, it's increasing for some of us and not necessarily for, for everyone. So. And I appreciate that point. I think once you have the nucleus though, then things tend to grow. And so that's the hope at least, 
is that you have that core nucleus, you ha you've shown people how it, to do it and what the benefits are of it, and then the hope is that people will go and adopt it and become part of it. Uh, but I do appreciate that point. Okay, um, so, so looking at this second question here, uh, talking about just, uh, you know, what's, uh, focusing on the question of just sort of broad usability of, of exascale and post exascale platforms, I, I'm actually reminded um, a bit of, uh, of some conversations that I have had with Barry Smith, the, uh, the original developer of Petsy that, that Todd mentioned. And um, what Barry and I were talking about some time ago was, um, so, so for instance, like I'm a, I'm a mid-career, uh, you know, I'm a mid-career researcher, uh, and when I started using Petsy seriously in about 2003, I started using Petsy because I wanted to be able to run some very challenging uh, hydrogeologic flow and transport simulations, and the only way to be able to do the, the, the kind of things that I wanted to do was to, to you know, learn how to use MPI, learn how to use tools like Petsy, and and you know write a bunch of the simulator myself. Just just you know starting from hey, I've got Petsy, I'm going to write a big simulation code doing this. Uh, you know nowadays, um, in, in a similar position, I might have just said, hey, you know a lot of people are using something like Julia. Uh, it's very easy to to write a bunch of things in Julia and maybe call some packages that run it on a GPU. Um, you know, you, there, there's some really powerful GPU systems, that just, you know, just a workstation that would, you know, let me run the, uh, the you know, bigger problems actually than I was trying to run in 2003 when I started, you know, using Petsy. Um, and, and building a, a simulation with Petsy takes a lot more, um, a lot more legwork and, and expertise than it does just, you know, writing something in Julia. And uh, I guess a question I have for, for those of us who are, who are in this, uh, you know, we're, we're running on big iron, doing these big supercomputer things. How do we, um, you know, try to make the, the kinds of simulations we're doing, like, approachable enough that, you know, the, the, the cool kids now who are writing these things in, in Julia or similar things like that, how do we make this so that, you know, our tools are usable enough or, or can maybe interface with what they're doing or you know, make them attractive to people who have these kinds of resources now uh, that are much more powerful and easy to use to, to put together some real scientific simulations than you know, what, what we had you know, when a bunch of us were starting. I'll say one, one thing is we can help build interfaces to Julia or to Python or things like that. So people who are running in these other languages can just call our stuff directly. Uh, from, from, from Sundial's uh, perspective, we got lucky. The Julia developers built interfaces to our stuff for us, and people have been using it since the, the beginning. So, but you know, if we wanted to update those to use our more modern algorithms, we, we would have to put in some legwork. So I think you know, we don't have to, it doesn't have to be either or, C versus Julia. There can be the interfaces that connect them. Anyone else? I, th I thought this would be a, a more provocative question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sure. Is Fortran dead? Yes. <laughs> There's a big difference between all dead and mostly dead. That's right. In talking with, with various applications very recently, who, who they're, they're using modern Fortran, they want Fortran interfaces, they want to be able to use, use our software. It doesn't seem like it's dead, but they've all now been saying, well, I really, really want to use the GPUs really well, and I, don't, I can't do this in Fortran. So they're starting to rewrite things in C++. So I, it might be dying, <laughs> but we've been saying that for decades. Right? So the, the deal is the vendors tend to treat Fortran as a second class citizen these days and they're not supporting it as fastly as or as rigorously as they used to. 
and so I think that's sort of setting the tone that it's it's on its way decline. Anyone else? I'm going to say that Fortran has been undead for a long time, <laughs> and and this I'm somebody who has I've written a whole lot of Fortran code. Um, I, I don't I don't really see it it going away. Uh, I, I don't know if it, we'd be that lucky, <laughs> but um, it is it isn't. Um, it does seem like as as others have mentioned, like I, I've seen people who I, I really thought would never you know, stop writing Fortran code who are, who are at least moving parts of their their code to, you know, C++ or, or things like that. Yeah, so Sherry's saying the real issue there is that none of us at our universities teach Fortran to our students and, and that I will agree. We don't teach Fortran to our students, and the uh, the computer science programs, you know, Fortran is a is an F word, and so they they like they come in and they you know they, they won't they won't learn it, uh, and so yeah, there there are certainly faculty who want to use it in their research, and they essentially have to train their grad students uh, from from scratch how to how to start doing Fortran. But but yeah, that there is not a built in mechanism at most universities for that kind of thing. But uh, my question for the other panelists is then, uh, what language should we use, uh, if not Fortran? I, th I think C++ is becoming way too complex, and it's also very hard to learn. Uh, so, so what should we use? So I think a lot of the high-level stuff and the orchestration bits, uh, Python and Julia make the most sense with C or C++ for the back ends. Yeah. Although Jed Brown would tell me Rust is the future. <laughs> okay, well we've, we've just got a, a couple more minutes, so uh, I will, I will ask this sort of question right here at the bottom, which, which you can't really answer in just a couple minutes. What? Oh, or, or that. Okay. Actually, yeah, we should take, are, are there other questions from the audience? Don't feel shy. Sorry, what are, what are the qualities in sort of young developers that you work with that you see uh, make them more likely to be successful? working with you? Is there a specific quality that stands out in your mind or in a controversial way is, are there qualities that you see lacking in new developers that you wish they'd had more of? <laughs> so I think it's really a mindset, critical thinking skills, you know, rapid prototyping, not afraid to fail. Uh, and really the, the critical thinking skills, the rest of it, you, you know, you can learn. Uh, but I think curiosity plays a big role as well. I think, um, I, you know, as someone who, who gets grad students and, and gets them, you know, through, through, through graduate school, for me, it, it, the big question is whether they, they will seek solutions themselves versus come and ask me every time they have a question. And, the, you know, I like to, to wait until they've taken a class with me before I will agree to be an advisor specifically for that question. Are they resourceful and can they find things themselves or are they going to, you know, come ask me over and over again for everything? And so I'll, I'll accept the first and I will, I will not accept the second. But, but I think the moment you're able to dig and find your own solutions, you're able to really find all kinds of stuff. And I, I imagine everyone here is, is like that. So I don't know if it really helps. put out and answer. Um, I think an important component is to be a developer and. Um, if you have some background in mathematics, you have some other so sort of subject matter expertise, I think that makes you a really unique candidate because you know we can all learn a different coding language relatively easily. You know We can all switch syntax, things like that. Um, but having that foundational layer is really important. 
I'm going to thank uh, everyone. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, thanks to all the participants. Uh, this has been a pretty long day, <laughs> and, uh, and we're out of time for the panel. Um, I, I do note, I, I did see some other interesting questions. Uh, please feel free to uh, you know, take your question and like, ask them on, on the track five uh, Slack. Uh, I think a, a bunch of us would be happy to engage with you. Thank you.